the tricky area in the performance management exam is always be the standard costing part. And in today's section, I'm going to be revising the standard costing in very simple words. Now, firstly, what do I mean by standard costing is that this is different from the actual costing. Because as you may have already studied before, that you've studied the first in first out method or the FIFO method or the weighted average method each and every time that we issue materials from the from the warehouse to a production department. So using a FIFO method, we need to chase the original invoice and to chase the actual costs to be the cost of issue for that materials to the production department. However, using a standard cost aim, we are saying that each and every time when we deal with our issue of material, we're going to be issuing that material to the production department to use at the standard costs, standard costs per unit there. So in terms of, for example, the materials, for example, let's say $5 per kilogram as a standard. Alternatively, for the labor, when we issue that labor to the production department to use, for example, $3 per hour and something like that. So that's very, very important there because for the standard cost day, it really saves a lot of management time as a result. Because each and every time when we issue materials or labor for the department to use, we don't really have to spend a lot of time in chasing the original invoice or the original purchasing invoice for that material. And it saves a lot of management time, especially for large multinational and complicated production uh, industry companies. However, the key problem lies with how we're going to set up our standard. And this is very important there, because when we're setting up a standard, actually, we have got four different choices. For example, the perfect standard and the attainable standard and the current standard and also the basic standard, which does not change over the years. Now, the idea being, let's say that if you're sitting in the ACC exam, I would say that you have to get 100 marks. So be perfect. So 100 marks would be the perfect standard. However, for example, for a given student, that that student has sat the PM paper in the past and has got, let's say, 48 marks. But now I motivate that student, OK, why not sit this exam for the next sitting and getting another two marks to be a passing mark 50. So after you've got two marks, so I will reward you. So this means that from 48 up to 50, OK, that would be a attainable standard. Uh, for the increase in that two marks, I will award you. Um, this means that this will be the, the attainable standard. However, if our student have sat the exam in the past and has got, let's say, 70 marks, so when he or she decides to sit the next paper, so because he's got 70 marks in the past, I would say to them, OK, just keep the 70 marks as a target for the next paper. So this means that maintaining the current standard. However, for any given businesses, if they are sitting, they are setting the basic standards, we are saying that only achieving the passing mark of 50, I'll be absolutely enough there. So which standard is the best? Of course, from the ACCA's point of view, a tailable standard would be the best because it's motivating the managers to work towards that target with necessary return, um, which means reward. However, from my perspective and from the academic's point of view, different businesses may be adopting a different standard in real life, and it's very hard to say that which standard is the best. Now, having said that, it's also very important that we bear that in mind that Standard costing is based on the concept called controllability. So this means that something you can't control, that we cannot punish you, in other words. So usually, when we are using standard costing in real practice, we'll combine the use of operating statement in most circumstances. Now, operating statement, from my perspective, is just to be a management account. So in other words, it's just to be the internal statement of profit or loss. But before we fully understand what do I mean by operating statement, I'll firstly need to introduce to you a very important concept 
called flex budget, or it can sometimes call as the flexible budget. Now let's see that. In terms of the flex budget, which means we are forecasting what will be going on, first is the business may be setting up a fixed budget at the very start. So let's say the business decides to sell at a fixed budget of 10 units of a product. Now, of course, giving rise to the expected sales revenue, let's say that the business decides to set up a selling price of $20 per unit and times by 10 units, so the fixed budget revenue being $200 there. Of course, the business would then need to subtract any associated costs to that. Of course, when we are preparing for the flex budget in a second, most often we will be splitting costs based on the cost behavior, which means into variable and the fixed cost part. So therefore, let's say we minus variable costs for that business. Let's say in making that product, we need the direct materials, direct labor, and also variable overhead, such as the electricity and maintenance costs to make that product, let's say to be $5 per unit, times by 10 units that we budget to sell, and that being the case, $50 there. And therefore, the budgeted contribution as a result for each unit, we aim to make $15 per unit on top of that 10 unit, and that being the case, $150 would be our budgeted contribution. We then minus the fixed costs, including the fixed production and non-production costs, such as depreciation, and also for the uh, fixed costs related to the salary of the sales staff, let's say $100. And therefore, we budget to make the profit being $50 there. Now, for that business, preparing the fixed budget, later on, it can, uh, it can certainly uh, change that budget or update that budget, for example, using a rolling basis or rolling budget. Alternatively, for the discretionary items, such as the research, development, training, and advertising expenses, so these expenses, we can also use the zero-based budget uh, to monitor them properly as well. Okay, so when we are preparing the fixed budget, we are only standing from a time period's point of view, uh, whether or not we will continuously update our budget. And of course, not every business would prepare uh, the flex budget uh, because if the variable and the fixed cost element, which means the variable cost element will not account for a high proportion of the total cost, we are not going to be preparing the flex budget to make sure that we compare like with like. So let me show you an example. Let's say that actually that you've sold 15 units of your product and making revenue worth of 210. So if that's the case, as you can see, the actual selling price that you've discounted already because you've taken 210 and divided this into 15 unit. So to review that result, we can prepare something called the flex budget to review that result so that we can compare like with like to see whether or not the marketing department is actually doing a good job. If I were to take the original standard, which means the standard price worth of $20 per unit, and to times by the actual number of units worth of 15, and that being the case, you should have earned me $300. But actually, they've earned me only 210. So the difference between the 300 and 210 worth of $90 less would be because if you discounted your product. And that $90 would be the selling price variance. Now, of course, the difference between the original of 200 from a fixed budget and the flex budget worth of 300 there, which means that you've sold five units more, okay, now five units more at the original of a standard price of 20, and that being the case, you have already made an uh, additional $100, but actually you've made $90 less because of the selling price that you've discounted to your customer, in other words. Now that $100 here will be called as the sales volume variance, okay, in terms of your selling price worth of 100. That's favorable 
okay, so we increase the profit up, because we take 300 minus 200, and the 90 will be negative, it's called octopus variance, in other words. Now let's move on, we've got the variable cost worth of 50 there, however, actually, that we've incurred, let's say, $60. If we incur $60 of a variable cost, if we only compare that with the fixed budget, that's not quite fair. Because for a fixed budget, it's based on that we expect to sell 10 units, but actually that we've sold 15. So if I were to review that result, okay, using a flex budget, that, okay, for each unit, for variable cost being 5, and based on 15 units, you should have spent $75, but actually, they've only spent 60 which means we can save $15 as a result. If we save $15 as a result, and that's called the favourable variance, in terms of your variable costs. I would say that variable costs will include lots of things, for example, the uh, materials, labour, which means the direct, um, direct materials and labour, and also variable overhead, okay, in terms of your electricity and maintenance, okay, in your factory. Now, let's revise the contribution there under the flex budget. Now, flex budget says that we've got 300 minus 75, and that being the case, 2 to 5 will be our contribution under the flex budget. The actual contribution, we take 210 minus 60, and that becomes 150. Of course, I would say that, okay, the difference between the first and second column is that for each unit, I should have made $15 of a contribution. And of course, we have got 15 units sold to the final customer, and therefore I should have earned 2 to 5 of a contribution instead of 150. Because compared with the original 150, we've got the additional 5 units that we've sold. And for each unit, I should have earned $15 per unit as the contribution. So therefore, I've earned $75 more than we planned before, okay, from the contributions point of view. And this is called the sales volume variance in terms of using the... Uh, marginal costing method because based on the contribution per unit there. At the same time as you can see there that we actually made $75 less okay because we compare the contribution under the flex budget with the actual result. Actual results we only made 150 of the contribution compared to the original high target of 225. We've made $75 less. Why? Because for example for a selling price we've made $90 less, but we've made $15 more as a result from the variable cost there. And overall, we make $75 less, okay, compared with our flex budget. Of course, finally, let's say that we've incurred $105 regarding those total fixed costs. So if that's the case then, regarding the flex budget, the fixed costs that we are going to be using there, we have to use the budgeted figure, which is $100, okay, in the second column. Two reasons behind it. Firstly, we are still preparing for the budget. And secondly, this is a fixed budget based on the actual units that we've sold. However, fixed costs will not change as the level of activity, which means the number of units that we sell changes. And therefore, we still use that 100 there to prepare for the flex budget. So if that's the case then, under the flex budget, the profit we should have made will be 125. For the actual profits that we've made, we've got 150 minus 105, and that being the case, 45 there. So why this will be a case? It's because when we look at the fixed cost there, when we look at the fixed cost there, we should have spent 100, but we actually spent 105. And this means that we spend $5 more, and this would be the fixed cost expenditure variance. And again, it's $5 less, and that being the case, will be the adverse variance. And therefore, as you can see, 
the, from the flex budget with the actual result, we have made $80 less in total. Why? Firstly, it includes the price variance, the selling price variance, we've made $90 less. At the same time, for the variable costs, we've made $15 more of a profit, but for the fixed costs, we've made $5 less of a profit. So overall, we've made $80 less of our profit. So to me, this is a management account. It's very, very useful there to identify from the fixed budgets the actual results, our uh, reconcil reconciliation process, and, and how the business has been doing uh, in the current year. And of course, as I touched the point about the operating statement, nowadays we are going to be transforming that uh, fixed budget, flex budget, actual result from left to right to the top to the bottom okay and this is why we're going to be introducing the operating statement to show the management of what is going on inside that business in much more detail there so for example we have got the fixed budgeted contribution so we take that figure from our original three column there. So firstly, we have got the fixed budgeted contribution being $150 highlighted in red. So we copy that figure in, 150 And we adjust for something called the sales volume variance because of the uh, sales volume changed from a budget to actual. As you can see, the sales volume variance that we have got, 150 minus 225, we have got 75 because we've sold more and therefore resulting in the favourable sales volume variance. That being the case, 75 there. So if that's the case then, that would give me 225, which means that would be something called the flexed budgetate contribution in the second column from our previous example. So after that, we need to adjust for, as I said before, the selling price variance, variable cost variance, and also the fixed cost variance. So selling price variance will be $90 at first. So we're going to be adjusting for the selling price variance at first, which means making less profit than we should. We're going to be adjusting for variable cost variance. And here, as I said before, the variable cost variance that we've made additional of $15 worth of profit. So it plus $15 back into our profit. Right. After we adjust it for them, we have got the actual contribution. Now, the actual contribution we take 2 to 5 minus 90 plus 15, and of course, that result would give me 150 for the actual contribution. So you copy that in, 150 there. And finally, we also need to adjust for the total fixed cost. So originally, I mean, per the standard or the fixed budget, we plan to spend our fixed costs in terms of depreciation and, and the fixed salary and so on worth hundred dollars there. But we overspend five dollars on that. So this means that originally a hundred dollars there. But we also have got the fixed cost variance in terms of Atvers variance, we overspend that five dollars there. So this means that the total fixed costs that we spend will be 105. 150 minus 105, and that becomes the actual profit. In the end, worth of $75. That $75 matches with the actual profit from what we've seen there. And of course, you may be 
remembering the operating statement here, we are using something called the marginal costing principle to prepare for that. Because we start with something called contribution. Okay. And then reconcile this to the actual profit. But of course, when we are preparing for the operating statement, we can also use the absorption costing principle um, to prepare for that, starting with the fixed budget profit, okay, and reconcile this up to the actual profit in the end. So making sure that you're aware that operating statement will be very, very important. It would be as the feedback control system. Now, what do I mean by feedback control system? It's going to be comparing actual with the budget. Unlike something called the feed forward control. Now, in the exam, feed forward control may be tested as the multiple choice question that we may be using target costing, we may be using the cash flows budget, and these will be the examples of feed forward uh, system to compare the estimated results with what we have gone through so far. So you can take corrective action uh, in advance, okay, to make sure that we align with our goals. Now here, very importantly, is that I'm going to be focusing on something called the variable cost variance in much more detail in, the, uh, in this particular section. Because as you can see from my table here, is that when we prepare for the variable cost variance analysis here will be $15 there. So we are basically comparing the flex budget with the actual result which means we are actually comparing the second column with the third column. And this means that we are actually have already reconciled the volume to the actual volume already, rather than still using the budgeted volume. So this means that later on when we, comp when we compute the variable cost variance, we always stick to the actual number of units that we've produced. Okay, so very, very important concept there. Of course, as I said before, that the variable costs variance will be the cost that would change as the number of units produced changes. Now, the variable cost can include the diet materials, diet labour, variable overheads. But here in this section, we are particularly interested in the direct material cost variance analysis. And of course, the pro forma, of course, there will be lots of pro forma that in different study tests, but the pro forma that I'm interested in, in working out that diet material cost variance will be using the standard quantity times by the standard price compared to actual quantity times by standard price compared to actual quantity times by actual price. So top minus bottom, and this is called the diet material usage variance. If the first line minus the second line is positive, okay, it's favourable, otherwise it's adverse. Second minus the third line will be the material purchase price variance. It's not a selling price, but purchase price variance from the supplier, in other words. So if positive, favourable, negative, adverse. Let me define what is going on in that. Firstly, let me define what do I mean by standard quantity. Now, standard quantity simply means that based on actual production volume with times by the standard kilograms per unit. But what do I mean by AQ or actual quantity? Yes, we use the same sentence here. Based on actual production volume, because we are assuming that 
how many units that we've produced will be the number of units that we've sold. And we times by the actual kilograms per unit. So make sure that you're ready. The standard quantity and actual quantity, these two will be all based on the actual production volume as a starting point. And of course, for a standard quantity, we call it as a standard because we are using the standard kilograms per unit. But the actual quantity, we are talking about the actual kilograms per unit. So the reason why we are using the actual production volume is that because now we are adjusting for the material cost variances, an example of the variable cost variance here, and we are comparing the flex budget with the actual results, which means the second and the third column. So this means that we have already reconciled the budgeted volume to the actual value, and this means that subsequently, in our subsequent calculations, we all base on the actual production volume now. So that's a very important starting point now. Let me again define the standard price. Now, what do I mean by standard price would be the standard dollar per kilogram. So the reason why we are using a standard price is because this is from the production department's point of view. Each and every time that we receive, I mean from the production department's point of view, because we need to produce the final product. So each and every time production department receives materials from the warehouse, each and every time we receive it, we need to put a cost on that. Instead of putting an actual cost per kilogram on that, we are putting the standard cost per kilogram on that. And this is what I mean by standard costing. Okay. And of course, what do I mean by AP is what I mean by the actual dollar per kilogram there. Which means each and every time that we need to reconcile this with the purchasing department in making sure that we can reconcile this back to the original purchase invoice, okay, from the external supplier, and to see how much they've actually paid. And the key behind the standard cost thing is that it will save lots of management time because for each and every time for the journal entries to reconcile that difference, which means in terms of variance, we will perform that, for example, at the end of each month. So this means that, okay, it will save lots of management time by not each and every time to reconcile our um, the cost to the uh, actual purchase invoice. So that would save lots of time in doing that there. And from the exams point of view, of course, the usage variance will be further broken down into the material mix variance and the material use variance. I would say that this will be a very uh, complicated area, but in fact it's not. Because the idea behind the mix and yield would be this. Mix, we are talking about if you were to change that component in making that product, changing that mix, changing that proportion, does it have an overall impact onto your costs? Yield means that as a result from changing your mix into producing that product, whether or not you're producing more units or less unit, whether or not that would be efficient, in other words. Of course, mix plus yield, and that becomes the usage variance. I mean, the best way to see this, from my perspective, is to have a go at an numerical example and to see what's going on in that. Suppose that we have got the complete information. In order to make that product, we have got the material A and B. And from a standard point of view, in order to make one product, we need 10 kilograms of the material A per unit, and we need 20 kilograms per unit of the material B to make that product. And for each kilogram of material A, we need to spend $4 per kilogram as a standard cost in there. And for B, we need to spend $6 per kilogram now. Of course, if I was to crunch some numbers in our standard cost card, 
10 times by 4, and that becomes $40 in, and then 120 there. So this means that for each unit of product, we need to spend 160. And that's called the standard cost card. And of course, if you're using a standard costing system, the business should maintain that standard cost card. There. At the same time, we are given the actual information, and this is why we need to compute the variances as the feedback control um, in order to calculate that variance, in order to appraise the manager whether or not you've done a good job or not. So, for example, actually, that you have already produced, let's say, 160 units of product. At the same time, you have already used material A, of 1,000 kilograms, and for material B, you have used 1,460 kilograms. So if that's the case, okay, as the first step, I would like to compute the usage variance firstly before I dive into the mix and yield variances. So let's firstly calculate the usage variance. As I said before, the pro forma that I'm using will be the standard quantity times by standard price and the actual quantity times by the standard price. And let's compute the material A and B together. Firstly, we have already produced 160 because for the quantity, either it will be a standard or actual quantity, it will be based on the actual production volume, which means 160 unit there. For the material A, and per the standard, that we need to use 10 kilograms per unit for material A. And for the material B, 160, you need to use 20 kilograms per unit, so times by 20 kilograms per unit there. Of course, for the standard quantity, 1,600 kilograms and 3,200 kilograms for the material B. So what we've actually used, of course, you can use 160 and times by the actual usage per unit, but we are given the question that we've used 1,000 and 1,460 kilograms for A and B. So for A and B, we've used... 1,000 kilograms for A and 1,460 kilograms for B. Of course, at this stage, we are still at the production department. And this is why we are using the standard price to account for what would be the uh, standard cost that we record each and every time that we receive materials from the warehouse. The standard price for A and B will be 4 and $6 each. So it times by $4 per kilogram, it's $6 per kilogram in there, 4 and 6, respectively, for the A and B materials. Let's compute that. For example, for A, I use 1,600 times by 4, and that be, being the case, $6,400. B, 3,200 times by 6, 19,200 there. And that being the case, 4,000. And I use 1,460 times by 6, 87, 60 dollars there. The next step that I'm going to be doing is that, okay, now, the total standard quantity times by the standard price here, if I were to take 6,400 plus 19,200, will be 25,600. And for B, I take 4,000 plus 8,760, being 12,760. Of course, if I were to use the first line, 25,600, and to minus the second line, 12,760, and that being the case, will be the overall material usage variance being a positive figure, which means favourable, which means making money for the business. So, 
being 12 840 dollars there. Now, because for each unit of product, I need to use two or more materials inside. So you need to see whether or not we've changed that mix and whether or not that changing mix will affect the efficiency of our final output. And this is why we will be computing what is called mix and yield variance. And here, I'm going to be introducing my own pro forma for the mix and yield. Now, to calculate that mix and yield, firstly, I would like to lay out something called AB in the middle. Of course, within our AB, we've got A and B. Okay, so we put A on the left and B on the right. We compute that difference, of course, later on we need to times by the standard cost per kilogram and to work out what is known as the mix variance and what is known as the yield variance, respectively for the material A and for the material B in that. Firstly, let me define what do I mean by A, A, B and B. Now, A will be the actual usage of the material. AB means the actual usage at the budgeted mix. And B will be the budgeted usage of material. Now, let's slot some figures in and to see what's going on. And we are told in the questions directly that we've actually used 1,000 kilograms of A and 1,460 kilograms of B. So 1,000, 1,460. Now, 1,000 kilograms and 1,460 kilograms for B. So if actually that we've used, how many kilograms in there? 1,000 plus 1,460, that being the case, 2,460 kilograms. Now, based on the 2460 kilograms, we've copied the figures into the second column, would be the actual one. So we copy them in, will be the A, 2460 kilograms, 2460 kilograms. Now, we need to know the budgeting mix. Now, according to that budgeting mix, as you can say at the very start, for each unit, we need a total of 30 kilograms in total. And material A will account for 10 over that 30, one third, and two third for the material B. And we apply that budgeting mix into our calculation, one third and two third. And that being the case, we take 2,460 divided into 3, and that being 820 kilograms. That being the case, 1,640 kilograms. Okay, in the second column. Now, right, let's see the mixed variance. The mixed variance for material A, I'm going to be using a colour red. I'm going to be using 1,000 minus 820. So 1,000 minus 820. So 1,000 minus 820. That being the case, 180 kilograms in there. If I need to times by, of course I have to, times by the standard price of $4 per kilogram, because we have to calculate that using the standard cost per kilogram because we are still at uh, the phase that we are calculating a usage variance. So $4 there. $4 there. Okay. Now, here's the rule. Because you are using more than budgeted, so this means that, yes, is at first because it's a cost and you are 
actually using more and the business will suffer and will losing will be losing money. At the same time, as you can say, for the material B on the other hand, yes, we take fourteen sixty kilograms and minus sixteen forty kilograms. That being the case, a hundred eighty kilograms for material B. And times by the standard cost in there, the standard cost for material B will be six dollars per kilogram there. You copy that in. That being the case, a thousand eighty. And because you should have used 1640, but it actually used less. And therefore, it would be a favorable variance worth of $1080 there. So make sure that you're ready. Now let's look at the budgeted figures. Now, for the budgeted figures, as you can see there, because we are calculating a cost variance, actually, that we are based on the number of units that we've actually produced, because the mix and use variance just derive from the original standard quantity and the actual quantity differences in that. We are computing that efficiency. And this is why, based on the actual number of units that we produce, which means 160 units in total, now, we have got, I'm going to be using another colour, for example, we have got 160 units in total. How many kilograms of raw materials do we need to use for the A and B? As I said before, yes, for A, we need to use 10 and 20 for B. So if that's the case then, for budget 8, 160 times by 10, 1,600 kilograms, and 160 times by 20, how much? 3,200 kilograms in there. The final step that we need to do is to compare the second column with the third column, which means the AB with B. Now, we should have used 1,600 kilograms, but we've actually used somewhere in the middle 820 because we've got the fixed element in, which means the actual element in of 820 kilograms. We've used less than we should. So if that's the case then, okay, I need to calculate something called the yield variance here. For A, I like to take 820 kilograms minus 1,600 kilograms. So if that's the case then, I've used less. So 820 minus 1,600, which means I've used 780 kilograms less. Using less, of course, save money for the business. Now, timing by the standard cost per kilogram there. Same as what we've seen before, $4 per kilogram, okay, for material A. We can save $31.20 as the favorable variance. I will explain why in a second. Now, same mechanism for B. We take 1,640 and to minus 3,200. That being the case, we have used 1,560 kilograms less. At the standard cost per kilogram, for B, will be $6 per kilogram. We've saved $93.60 as the favorable variance. Now, let's summarize these all together and to prove from a mathematical point of view and to see whether or not it really uh, be the same as the uh, usage variance for materials before we dip into any further. Now, for the mixed variance in total, we have got 30, 720, adverse, and 1080 as a favorable. So we take minus 720 and to plus 
1080. So if that's the case then, minus 720 plus 1080, that being the case, being 360 favourable, because it's positive. For a huge variance on the other hand, we take these two figures, plus them all together. 3120, 9360. So uh, 3120 and 9360, all favourable. So huge variance being 12480, favourable. Finally, let's plot these all together. We have got 360 as the mixed variance favourable. We have got 12,480 for the yield variance being favourable. And that being the case, if I sum this up into my calculator, that being $12,840. Okay, it matches what we've said in a usage variance. So make sure that you're ready for that. Now, finally, let's analyse what is going on. Now, as we can see there, let me use another colours to highlight this. Now, we should have used 1,600 kilograms. However, we've actually used 1,000 kilograms for A. So this means that we've used less so, of course, yes, the business will save a lot of money, but we're not, the production department has changed its production methodology to produce that product. We're not particularly sure. And therefore, let's analyse these into the second column. According to our original plan, you should have used 820 kilograms, but actually you've used 1,000 it seems to me that you're using more of the material A and less of the material B. Why? It seems to me that, okay, you're using more of a cheaper material of A and you're using less of the more expensive material B. Alright, seems like you're sacrificing the quality to a certain extent. Okay, now, that mixed variance will simply reveal that we are changing that original plan, which means the original proportion of the material mix, and therefore the business saves money worth the first $60 as a result. It seems to me that's okay, not a problem at all. But let's see the yield variance then. For the yield variance, as you can say, okay, you should have used 1,600, but... Uh, According to the original plan, based on your actual usage, you should use 820, but you should have used 1,600. You save a lot. And therefore, it seems to me that you're actually using quite less of the materials in terms of A and B after you're changing that mix. You're actually very efficient. You're saving quite lots of money as a result. You're saving... $12,480 as a result. So it seems to me that your output is great. But let's demonstrate this using another way to calculate that yield variance to review the actual efficiency of this company. Now, the way I'm going to be calculating that yield variance in reviewing the output efficiency is the first row I will be calculating how many unit should have produced. And the second row I will be calculating how many unit did produce. Now, since that you have used for the material A and B, total of 2,400 kilograms 
over đấy For each unit, you should have used a total of 30 kilograms. So divide this into 30 kilograms per unit. So if I were to use 2460, divide this into 30, I should have produced 82 units in total. But actually, in the question, it says that we've produced 160 units in total. We produce more than we should. So in other words, you've produced 78 units more. So in other words, given that we've spent that amount of money, but we produce more, and this means we're more efficient. And this means that this is the favourable variance. So for each unit, as I said before, according to our standard cost car here, will be $160 per unit. So we times by 160. So in other words, the yield variance in total, 78 times by 160, being $12,480 in total, that's favourable. That's the yield variance. So as you can see, by changing that mix, we are actually more efficient, producing more units of output, and that's good for a business. So that's how we interpret the usage variance, where that we've got two or more materials inside. So we've got two or more materials inside at the same time that we can control that mix. And therefore, we can calculate something called the mix and yield variances. So make sure that you're ready, from the exam's point of view, this would be a vital area in the exam. So make sure that you're ready to calculate the mix and yield variance. And also for the yield variance, you always need to understand there will be two ways that you can calculate that. So the first way, using my own approach to compare the A, B and B. And the second way is to compare the first row should have produced and did produce. And to make sure they times by the standard cost per unit there. Okay, I'm going to be stopping the section on the uh, first part of our uh, operating statement or the standard cost thing revision part of your study and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye bye. A P C accounting for your future.